Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the live stream. My name is Matt Bailey. I'm your national ambassador for the Scotchport Whiskey Society here in Australia. And we are live on Facebook, on YouTube, uh, across our society channels, talking about all things rum tonight. Yes, I know. We just saw a little thing that said uh, Australia's whiskey community. Uh, it's also a rum community. Why not? You know, it's a bit of fun. And of course, I'm talking about uh, that one. Wait, wrong way. That one. That rum. Uh R13.2 is the discussion today, uh, and we're going to just um, make sure that we have everything sorted for, for this evening. It's Friday night. It's 7.30. Thank you so much for joining in and watching along and learning a bit about rum as we go. I thought what we'd do tonight, uh, and I won't make this a mega live stream or anything, but what we'll do tonight is we'll talk a little bit about what rum is, how it's made, uh, because sometimes, I mean, we enjoy these spirits, and we had the opportunity to talk about whiskey before. We've had many times talking about about barley, about water, about yeast, about production, about stills, about all those kind of things. Uh, and then if we have the opportunity to talk about production of other spirits, it's a bit of fun anyway. So it's kind of like, why not? Like it's kind of a bit, you know, what whatever whatever. So uh, all these people throwing their throwing their emojis in, throwing their yes, their rock and roll right here. Look, look, look. I, I'm not still not used to this 2021 setup I've got going on here. Uh, the, <laughs> the discount Archie luxury music intro. Thank you, Ryan D. Marshman. Hmm, I'm not sure that's a real name. Um, this song makes my Friday high. I'll see some people like it, Ryan. That's okay. Uh, <laughs> so um, really appreciate you all tuning in to talk about R13.2. It's a Caribbean rum. It's a Trinidad rum. It's uh, a 22-year-old single cask. Now, this rum, actually, that I'm going to taste and pour, and I've not actually tasted this yet. I've not tasted this rum at all yet. This rum actually had its first feature uh, in our whiskey advent calendar, uh, which was which came out just at the end of last year. I still think there's like one or two or maybe three advent calendars left on the site. It doesn't have to be Christmas for you to enjoy a pack full of whiskeys. So if you still wanted to grab one of those packs, there's still one or two left. I'm going to pour this into the glass now. So this, the reason why I've got a miniature, as I said, is because I don't have the full-size bottle in the office. I do have this miniature, however, um, which I'm going to pour now, and I've not actually tasted this before. But I'm going to pour that into one of our spirit tasting glasses and go from there. So let's, whilst I'm letting that open up in the glass for a bit, I'm going to talk a little bit about, about rum, how it's made. It starts, of course, it starts with sugar cane. Um, that's the, the base... Oh, sorry, that was my last... I meant to go to that slide. This rum, R13.2, is the second ever cask from this distillery, this closed distillery. Uh, and this is the second cask we've ever approved by panel from this distillery. I don't think we're going to see much more. This might be it. Um, I don't know that for sure. I can't say that for sure. Um, <clears throat> pardon me. Uh, Jesse Morgan says he's making pizza as he's watching this. Eager to hear your thoughts on the future releases. And someone else writes, crazy outturn this month, covers all bases, old and young whiskey, funky rum, and a cool bourbon. It's a pretty diverse first outturn for the year. We didn't do an outturn technically in January. We put some releases out each Friday, but we didn't do an outturn. So uh, this, this month is an outturn. Fr February is an outturn. But um, my next slide was just showing, yeah, it all starts with this. It all starts with the sugar cane. Now, um, and even to this day, while there's production methods and things are changing in whiskey all the time, mature rum, mature sugar cane, sorry, let's say rum, mature sugar cane is harvested by hand still at most rum distilleries. It's still harvested by hand. There's no massive sort of combine harvester that cuts all the rum up. It is still mostly cut by hand with machetes in many, many parts of the world. That sugar cane is then transported to a mill where it's crushed in a machine and that extracts the sugar cane juice from the fibrous pulp. And that, that crushed pulp waste is uh, is usually burned to create power to crush that cane and sometimes also to heat distillation stills. So to heat stills, I should say. Um, so then there's three things that can happen. One, after they've crushed all that up, one, you can proceed directly to fermenting and distilling the sugar cane juice. Uh, two, or you can cook it down and concentrate the sugars and turn it into a syrup. Or three, you can process that juice and uh, into molasses and crystallized sugar. So the crystallized sugar is... Uh, sold usually as a sweetening product, but um, molasses is usually can be um, can be sold to a distillery and then fermented uh, and distilled into rum. 
Uh, most rum in the world is distilled from fermented molasses. Uh, even, I mean, there's a movement going on towards sort of more agricole, like um, that first one, like fermenting and distilling the sugar cane juice. And they're fantastic rums as well, but they're very different. If you've tasted things from R11, that's more on that first one, more like sort of distilled sugar cane juice, Jamaican sugar cane juice. Whereas uh, these ones are probably most likely molasses. But anyway, um, the next step, of course, is distilling that that product. Um, and that's it's not too different from how whiskey is distilled. It goes through a still. Um, normally, it goes into that first and second vessel, usually first, you know, um, uh, yeah, and it, that the it's for the ferments are heated and it goes into the sealed vessel and evaporates the alcohols from the liquid. Um, and the, the the size and shape of stills in rums uh, varies wildly between distillery, just like it does in whiskey as well. Uh, some are pot still, some are column still style, and and then generally it varies again around the world and around the market has how it's made. But what we're tasting tonight, what we're tasting tonight is a single cask. Uh, rum from a distillery that no longer exists and it kind of looks actually i'll zoom in first so you can see the um the uh the sugar cane itself there it is that's what it looks like after it's been chopped that one that photo is from a, a cuban distillery this is not a trinidad distillery that one um after that it's then uh yeah the, the one we're tasting actually sorry, sorry i should say comes from a distillery that used to be in this building here and it no longer exists obviously you can see that it's a derelict building covered in weeds uh, these photos were taken three years ago, and they just didn't, oh, sorry, almost four years ago, 2017, these photos were taken. You can see the sort of the concrete plates of where the stills were. The copper's worth a lot, so they're not going to let just the copper rot away in that old distillery. But this distillery is, is and I keep saying this distillery, but it's R13. I'm not going to say the name of it, but I will make very, very strong reference to it in a second. Don't worry. Um, so uh, let's let's talk a little bit about this actual, um, this actual rum. This, um, I've let that sit in the glass for a couple of minutes now. Oh, yeah. Now, this distillery was founded in 1923. It was founded on the site of the old Coroni Sugar Factory. There you go. I can get away with saying Coroni, Coroni Sugar Factory because that's where it was from. It was founded on top of an old sugar factory, so they had it, it obviously a great spot for it. Um, it used both column and pot stills. I think you can see from that photo there that's perhaps uh, where, where they sat. You can see... I don't know if you can see my mouse cursor, but that's that's sort of like there would have been a pair there and a pair there, perhaps. Um, not really sure. Hmm. Uh, so, um, so it, yeah, it was founded in 1923, used pot and column stills, ran from 1923 till 2001, pretty much un uninterrupted that whole time. Um, and it was known for producing naval uh, rums for the British Navy, so heavy rums for the British Navy. Now, British naval rum has a certain style, has a certain taste to it, and that was the style and taste that they were going for, and that was what was being supplied mostly to British Navy. Now, this, this is, of course, you know, wartime rums and everything. This is a very cool history of one distillery in Trinidad that is worth looking at and worth tasting. So in 2001, uh, there was a great protest about it being sold off by the government. Um, so they sold it to Angostura, uh, a brand I'm sure many of us are familiar with. Uh, they make bitters and all sorts of other stuff. Um, however, that sale in 2001, uh, may have killed off the distillery that may have killed the distillery, but it was in 2002, the following year that a man named Luca Gargano of Velier fame and Velier is, uh, uh, do lots of things like they do spirits, grocery lines, um, imports, exports, uh, a very big Italian company. And Luca Gargano is quite a, um, What's the word for a uh, nomadic kind of lifestyle of someone? He's quite sort of um, uh, quite an adventurer, quite a tra traveler and trailblazer. And he uh, uncovered a warehouse full of maturing stocks from the distillery that had closed. And it was, and there was, uh, it wasn't, it wasn't of anyone's use. And he actually bought that stock uh, and then bottled a lot of spirit from this distillery from, that used to sit on the Coroni sugar factory. And uh, some of it was great, some of it wasn't, but most of it was very interesting snapshot uh, of of the distillery of its time, of, of what they were doing. Now, this is exactly what this is. Now, this was distilled on New Year's Day, 1998. Yeah, 1st of January, 1998. I was getting that right. And it spent its entire life in a first fill uh, ex-bourbon barrel. So it's an ex-bourbon barrel 
uh, single cask Coroni Sugar Factory location R13.2, and it's called Ready Made Marmalade. Immediately on the nose, I get like that pineapple note, that uh, rich sort of uh, like crushed pineapple. Not unusual for a, for a good rum though. Bit of um, orange peel or blood orange, something going on there. Bit of coconut, coconut cream. And a bit of that sort of fresh ginger as well. Now, this is the second one. Like I said, we had a first one, uh, which came out about two years ago called R13.1. Uh, Deep, dark, and brooding was that one. I featured that at a few. I featured that at a few events around the country back then. Uh, really fantastic rum that was. That was also a little bit dearer as well. This one is a little bit cheaper, but it's also two years older. This one's two years older than the new one, so that's kind of cool. So I don't really know if we're going to see much out of out of R13 again at the society. This is a closed distillery. I fully appreciate that closed rum distilleries aren't quite as sexy as closed whiskey distilleries for some reason. And I think it's a little bit unfair because they make some of the most amazing spirits. This is a 22-year-old. Now, this if this is a 22-year-old whiskey from Distillery 43, I think that'd be probably not, it wouldn't be 595 in an outturn. It'd be 5595 in an outturn, let's be honest. Darren Howie, good to see you. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Um, James Caden, good to see you, of course. Um, I bet they were bitter about that. Yeah, I mean, Yes, they are. Yeah, they look. They they are fantastic rums, and they they did some. They have released some fantastic things. If you like the style of that first style of rum I mentioned, that distilled uh, sugarcane juice, that sort of agricole style uh, rum, then you you're better looking at things like R two, R elevens, even R sixes. Um, however, if you like that sort of dark naval rum rich kind of naval rum notes that you get out of some. You're going to love something like this. Can't get over that sort of like ginger and coconut note. <sighs> yeah. So we have a huge a huge uh, thanks, obviously, to Luca Gargano for reviving uh, what we knew of those stocks. And I'm really appreciative that we were able to source and pick out some of these amazing casks. That's amazing. It's it's truly like a, a true rarity of, of the rum world right here. There's a slight, almost like a, a, a balsa wood, like pine balsa wood note as well that you don't normally see in, in rums of this age. Um, now, Martin Eber here. Martin, good to see you, mate. Actually, it's been a while. Hope you're well. Um, sorry if I missed it. How many bottles are there? Uh, in outturn, I'll get to that. Let me bring that up on screen now. Here we go. There's there's our slide. Uh, we've got 36 bottles. You know what? I think that's a very healthy allocation for quite a rare rum. There we go. So Trinidad, first fill barrel, 22-year-old, 1st of January, 1998. Uh, global allocation from that cask was 267 bottles. The ABV sat at 62.1%, and uh, the allocation is 36, like I say. A fruit-driven nose, burst open with ripe apples, pineapple. There you go, pineapple. I said that. Mango and guava with bundles of molasses, dusted with cinnamon and ginger. Ah, I wasn't too far off. Spicy marmalade joined us on the palate with cloves and black currant syrup. So there's a lot going on in this in this rum. And, um, and yes, Martin, hope you're well as well. Hope you're well, mate. Yes, we're all doing really well here. You know what? It's Friday after Friday evening. I'm doing a quick live stream to introduce one of the spirits that's upcoming on our February outturn for next Friday. It is a week from today until February outturn. Really excited for that uh, because it's finally we've actually got our first proper outturn of the year. Uh, January was, like I say, a few releases each week, but just great to get back into the rhythm of some great outturns. And it is a very diverse outturn. As someone pointed out earlier, there's a lot of young, old, Stock in there's young stock in there, there's old stock, there's three vaults collections, there's the vaults virtual, which I want to talk about in just a second. And uh, but before I do, um, I did get the balsa wood note. You're, you're right, James. Uh, sorry, I didn't actually get through all those notes just then, but there is a there is almost a balsa note to it. There's like a, a, a slight, um, yeah, like a real sort of slight balsa, um, fresh pine. Some some rums, when you taste some rums, especially those sort of sugarcane style ones, they have this uh, 
they have this brilliant kind of like brisk uh, green leaf note. I don't know how to describe that really. It's it, it's something else. Whereas these kind of heavier style naval rums are far more complex, uh, but uh, but they, they're just a different spirit. And I like to think of them as very different. Whether you're distilling molasses or you're distil- distilling the juice itself, they're very different ways of making the spirit. Uh, and what I'm tasting here, and what I'm nosing and tasting here, mm. oh, wow. Ooh. <laughs> oh, bear with me. That's my first dram of the day, and it's 62.1%. That's a ripper. Oh. I was in a live stream earlier today, actually. I did a live oh, – I, I wasn't in the live stream. I was, I was listening along to a live stream of some whiskey bloggers on um, Instagram who were talking about how rum, if you're not careful, can um, really pull the carpet out from underneath you. <laughs> and I think that's a really good quote. Uh, I know if you have some really high-proof whiskeys and you have a few whiskeys. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but I just get a bit tired and I go, all right, time to go to bed. But like these, when you have these high proof rums, um, they can really, they really they can be almost like wake me up juice. And and you get this sort of uh, experience of the, of the spirit being, uh, I guess, quite, uh, it's quite front of head, if that makes sense. Some whiskeys and some spirits uh, sort of sit back of palate or warm, warm the chest. A lot of these rums that I f- often try are, are quite briskly front, of, like right on the sinus in some ways, um, which is fine. Um, but you know, just, it's just a different kind of spirit. The reason why I've got this slide up here is because uh, our good friends down at Whiskey and Ailment, and I say down because I'm in Sydney, but the our good friends down at Whiskey and Ailment in Melbourne, a wonderful partner bar of ours, have picked up a pardon me a small allocation of the outturn for February, and it's uh, they're open every night. Uh, that's not even remotely true, but you know. I said it. So you know what? I don't know what nights they're open off the top of my head. I think they're doing like Wednesday to Sunday or something, or Thursday to Sunday. Um, but you've got you've got some awesome whiskies there that they've got on. They're mostly peated offerings at the moment that are on the bar there that you can try by the dram. And the other little thing I want to mention tonight is, of course, our massive vault collection virtual, which is in the uh, in the February outturn. Here it is. Look at that lineup. That's absurd. That's just absurd. Anyway, the youngest whiskey is 30 years old and the oldest is 38. There's four 30-year-old whiskeys there and one 38-year-old whiskey. Very exciting indeed. We're excited by that. Um, but going back to uh, going back to Outturn for a second, R13.2, the ready-made marmalade, is in Outturn, is in our, our February Outturn. It's listed there. Uh, bring, that, bring that slide back up again. Uh, where are we? Here we are. Listed there, 595. Yes, it's a lot for rum. I know that. It's less than the dot one was, which was this one, the deep, dark, and brooding. And we've got 36 of them, so it sounds like a lot, but it's not really because, like I said, this is a very finite resource of a closed distillery of a very complex, old spirit, single cask spirit. Uh, 22-year-old single cask rum. I keep almost saying whiskey. I'm so used to saying the word whiskey. And I've just been nosing and appreciating it over the last 20 minutes. Some rums also, some of the sugar cane style rums often have that, uh, what's the word for it? Um, <laughs> have that sort of acetone lipstick um, kind of note to it. And again, very different style to this old school kind of dusty bookshelves, uh, sweet pineapple, coconut cream kind of rums. This, These are sort of more, that sort of ventures more into the, um, acetone kind of rums, which I love as well because they have a certain uh, a certain character difference which is enjoyable in, a, in its own right, of course. Um, how many pa- a great question here from James. How many packs of the tasting are available? Now that's a really hard one for me to answer because we've bottled up enough for from one bottle each at the moment. But depending on demand, we'll see if we can go into a second range, but if we can't, we'll see how we go. So the an- the short answer is, about 20, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it's also a super premium pack that should have been priced at nearly double what it is, but we want to make sure members can ex- access it and it's affordable and it's accessible and it's something that is, is for everyone, not just those with deep pockets. So 
It's a really special pack. It's coming actually packed much differently from our usual online tastings. Um, but that's, you know, it's it's coming really nicely put together. Yeah, Airflick, Airfix glue, no, to go with the balsa wood model. See, this one's got a little bit of that balsa going on, but it doesn't have any Airfix glue. And I love that note in some rums, and I get it especially in Jamaican rums. Uh, I get like R, uh, R7s, R11s that we get. You get, we haven't seen many, too, too many R7s. Next R7 we get, I'm putting myself down for one as well, that's for sure. Um, but the R11s I often pick up, uh, and they have that um, airfix note is, is, a, is really prominent, and you get that like fresh glue gun, like glue gun in a, in a um, glue, should, we could even call one of them glue gun in a workshop. Like, I mean, it, it'd be popular. I mean, even goat farms and vinyl esters was popular. And yeah, that was an R2, I think. I'm going to sit on this for the next sort of, I'd say, half hour, but I don't need to, you. You don't need to endure me enjoying a, a $600 rum. So what I encourage you to do instead is grab a bottle next Friday if you're really, if you are into those old school rums, especially from something, uh, especially a, a snapshot of a distillery that no longer exists. And I, I really do stress that how I, I just think it's just crazily absurd how uh, we can have uh, closed whiskey distilleries. And people go crazy for closed whiskey distillers. And I get it because they are, again, they taste fantastic. Some of them, some of them weren't so great. And it's also a snapshot in time of something that isn't being produced anymore. This is exactly the same. This is a cool sort of moment in sort of history of a distillery that no longer exists anymore and was revived by someone who we're very thankful for and we've worked closely with in sourcing the last two casks we're, we're seeing here. And that's kind of like, that's all there is to it. It's just an exciting like piece of history. It's like acquiring an old artwork. But in the case of Good Spirits, the artwork only really makes sense. And I can't stress this enough. If you like, if you if you're like me and you like to compare old spirits from closed distilleries to old artworks, then I can't stress this enough. They are only art if they are being opened and enjoyed. Now you could say to me, "Oh, I want to collect it and I want to hold on to it for years." That's fine as well. I'm not going to tell you what to do with your spirits. That's fine. But I'm going to say it's almost, uh, it's like buying, or another example would be something else I'm quite passionate about. If you could, if you bought a supercar and never drove it, because it might be worth something one day, you know, I think that's terrible. I think that's terrible, but that's you. You do you, as I say. Okay. It's, uh, I won't hold you on for much longer. I want to thank you all for tuning in. Of course, it's, it's been fantastic coming in just for a quick live stream to talk about the first of, Three live streams that I'm going to be doing on releases from out term. The next, the next live stream is on a spirit that is in a black label. Oh, look, I can tell you now, the next two releases I'm going to review, I haven't decided the order yet, is of course the 145.1, the Swedish whiskey. And I'm also going to have a quick taste and look through the 113 Malt of the Month, the code of which escapes me, but the Malt of the Month is going to also get on this live stream next week. We're very, uh, we're very happy about that. Um, awesome comment here. All my closed distilleries are open. I can't see who actually wrote that, but I really appreciate that because we don't know. There's two things. I don't want to get into rant of that, but there's two things I'll just make mention of. I'll leave that comment up for this one. When it comes to opening closed distilleries, when it comes to actually tasting and appreciating whiskey from closed distilleries, first of all, we don't know how good they are unless they're open, unless we actually taste them. If, we, if we're holding a bottle of Port Ellen or a bottle of Coroni and going, yeah, these are the greatest, how do you know that if you're never going to open them, if, it, if they're just there for eye can shelf candy? And the second thing I'll just say is that I say the same about um, sometimes going back to core range whiskey as I do sometimes and going, oh, that's why I like single cask whiskey so much. And, I, and you don't know how good whiskey is until you've tasted some of the bad stuff. I, I'm, I, I really mean that. It's like, oh, just thought a little bit of it. It's all good. Um, I'm getting a bit passionate here. So um, I, re I really mean that, though. Like, you don't really know how good it is. Um, I like the shape of these glasses. When I, I knocked the glass and it hit the keyboard a little bit, uh, and it's barely spilt more than a mil or two. That's good. So uh, I really mean that. Like, it's, it's opening these and appreciating them and tasting them is... Is uh, it won't make sense unless unless you actually you know make sense of it and taste these things. Sorry, just bear with me a moment. Technical issues, um, and that's what's most important is is actually knowing and appreciating and tasting these whiskies. 
Me. <laughs> I'm going to go with either Martin or Steve. You know what? I'm going to go with Martin or Steve on that comment. Um, in the meantime, I want to thank you all for being a part of these live streams, for um, for sharing these experiences with you and and coming along for the ride and, and tasting a few things along the way. Why not? So in the meantime, I will um, leave it there for now. Out turns out next Friday, Friday the 5th of February at midday ADT. And uh, again, thank you so much for being part of the live streams, having a chat with me, and I'll see you all soon.